you all for coming. Good evening. Um, a lot of you all have come from across town, um, you know, making your mind up to come here today, and I'm really, really grateful for that. Thank you so much for coming. Um, this this talk is the first one after several months. Because the summer was really hot, as you can, as you all know. Uh, but more than that, this talk has been about. Uh, seven or eight months in the making, and it started with uh, with us, with me reading uh, an article uh, in the, on the internet. It was a story that James wrote, and it moved me. It touched me. And which James? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it, uh, I almost immediately looked up who the author was, and I wrote to wrote to him, found him online, and I wrote to him. Again. And I said, if you're ever in India, or you, know, you have an open invitation to, to come and share your work with us in Pune, and uh, within a few hours I got a reply, I love India, it's, it's like my second home, and I'd love to come. And over the, over the next months, we, we uh, corresponded on WhatsApp call and email, and um, James has been really, really generous with his time. And uh, he flew over here. You know, we could not, uh, in, in, his, in real generosity, he's been here. Uh, we, we did not support his, his flight to come here. That's something that James did on, of his own accord. And, and it's something that's really never happened. Somebody coming from a different continent to be here with us, that's really special. So that's the first thing I want to say. <laughs> not just that. Um, James said that I would love to speak at and you know share some of my work at different schools. So um, one of us, Tanya, Tanya Ramat, who uh, runs the Watering Can Foundation, it's a it's a non-profit publishing house. And Tanya and her son Dave are regulars at the loft. And uh, so I, I reached out to her and requested her to help us figure out how um, we can make this happen and Tanya connected, uh, connected James with five or six schools and James spent uh, several days this week talking to school kids. Um, I'm not going to say much more. Uh, what I know of James in the last few days has been, uh, is, I know over the last few months of corresponding with him, is that he's someone who uh, reaches out to people through our common shared humanity. And when I asked him, what would you like to speak about, he said, I, 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 I'm, I'm a humanist, and I would love to speak about our shared humanity. Uh, apart from that, James has been, he started off, uh, grew up in a small country town, he's going to talk to you about it, but, and uh, started off as a radio journalist, uh, moved on, has worked as a journalist, a broadcaster all over the world, uh, including a cricket, cricket journalist, and um, just last couple of weeks ago, released his finished and published his 13th non-fiction book. Mm. So we have a candlelit evening. <laughs> <laughs> Will you marry me? <laughs> Firstly, thank you very much to Kushru 
and Tanya Kushru, as he just mentioned, we've been in touch in a, when I actually first met him after being in touch for so long via email. We, I got out of the, the cab and we met with a hug and it felt so very normal and it felt as if though I'd known him for a, a very long time. And I appreciate all your efforts in making this evening happen and your generosity and your kindness you've shown me. Tanya, up the back, in the dark, um, in the middle of the night as it were. Um, Tanya was the liaison person with schools and Tanya did a wonderful job and I feel very connected with Tanya and I feel very, I think I've learnt more on this trip, although I once lived in India for a year, I've learnt more about education in particular and about the, the realness of children, which I'll get into a little bit later, is a very important thing for me. As a way of introduction, obviously you all know who I am because I'm a very famous person in cricket folklore. <laughs> um, and for those of you who, who don't know, I, I forgive those of you who do know, um, but I, I thought I should recap the story of which many of you know, so forgive me if I repeat myself. Um, in 1995, when I was a, a television journalist with a, a station in Australia, I was on tour, and it was my first big tour, and it was to the West Indies. And for a boy who grew up wanting to play cricket for Australia, and was stopped by only one thing, and that one thing being talent, <laughs> to be able to actually <laughs> to be actually able to go on tour with the Australian team and be in the inner sanctum as a journalist was something. Well, it was. It, it, was, it was a cliche. It was a dream. And on this particular day in Trinidad, there was a little-known fellow, not as well known in cricket legendary status as I am, called Steve Wall. And uh, he was just walking off to the cricket nets. And he had pads under his arm and a bat, and he just looked over, and he, as Steve Ward tended to do, he just spoke. He, he, when Steve Ward talks, you barely see his lips move. I mean, that's an Australianism, because if your lips move too much, you catch too many flies. So you keep, <laughs> so you keep them close together. And he said, can you bowl? You don't ever know me as a journalist. And I said, oh, well, I yeah, play a bit of cricket in Sydney. Better have a bowl for me, eh? I need some bowling, I need some batting practice. So I, I bowled at him and by the end of it, Steve War ultimate compliment was, yeah mate, you go all right, don't you? <laughs> so out of that, I happened to be on every tour we went on a net bowler for the Australian team, <laughs> which was just, once again, dream. Put two next to it, dream square, dream times dream, it was unbelievable. And all the while, the Australian players were always very kind to me. Back in those days, back in those days, it's only 20 years ago, it's yesterday, as it were, um, they used to divide the nets according to the bowling type. So the spinners were in one net, medium paces were in another, and the fast bowlers were in another. So I bowled with Shane Warne all the time. And Warney didn't bowl much leg spin because it hurt his shoulder too much to bowl too much outside of in matches. So he used to bowl off spin. And he would ask me what type of ball I was bowling and then he'd try to bowl it and then he would give me advice. So to get advice from someone like Shane Warne was something quite special. And at the other end, the batsman would say, yeah, well, bowl James or follow through a bit more. Steve Wall was really good at giving, giving feedback. A bit more air, a bit more this, a bit more this, this, this and this. The only person who never complimented me was Mark Wall. And that was in Mark's nature, because Mark never rated off spinners from test level down. So when a, a humble pie-throwing person like me bowled, you know, I was, I was a nobody. And I ended up writing a biography about him, which we'll probably get to a little later in, in Q&A. But on this one particular day at the Sydney Cricket Ground, sometimes when you, 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 you can be in the zone, 
and I bowled this one particular ball and it left the hand beautifully. Absolutely. It was like a butterfly in fight. It was beautiful. And I knew it was. I was watching it spin and zip and do all the things and I knew where it was going to land and I knew the repercussions of that landing. Mark Wall was going to go one, two, and he was going to pick me a return catch. I knew it. Mark Wall caught a bowl, James Knight, tested with him, thank you very much. <laughs> it was going to happen. So, <coughs> waiting for that moment. So Mark Wall takes these two steps up. So far, so good. <laughs> over my head, over the net, over the wall, surrounding the Sydney Cricket Ground, bouncing <coughs> down the road outside the Sydney Cricket Ground. And Mark's only response, and was about the only time he ever commented on the bowling, was, sorry James, but it was, he served exclusive blank. So, that was it. A little while later I had to get back to work. And I had to catch a taxi back to work. So as we were leaving the Sydney Cricket Ground, as we were just driving away, I saw this scuffed red leather ball in the gutter. And I said to the taxi driver, stop, 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 stop! And he didn't know what I wanted, but it stopped him. And got out and got the very ball I had bowled. And it's still a very precious piece of memorabilia to me. It's kept in my sports cabinet to this day at home in Australia. And as you know, and I'm sorry, but you already know the punchline, but to this day I'm the only bowler in history who's bowled a ball that's been hit so far I've had to catch a taxi to go up <laughs> So, why am I here? I've thought a lot about that, and in many ways it, it comes back to cricket. It, cricket showed me the world. When I first started following the Australian cricket team as a journalist, um, I, I didn't want to see the world as such. I'd been on, on trips before. And yes, I, I was curious, but then I went to the West Indies. And then the following year I went to India and the, the lick of the, my imagination, the wick of my imagination was lit, and away we went. But before we get to that point, the cricket world I saw was a very, very, very long way from where I grew up. And it's there's, a, there's a, an expression in Australia that you, can't, you can take the boy out of the bush, but you can never take the, the bush out of the boy. And I will, to the day I die, be a, an Australian bush boy. And uh, it's, I'm, I'm very proud of that. For many reasons. I grew up in a, a little farm on the edge of a town called Gunnedah in New South Wales, Australia. My father was a veterinarian and my mum was a poet and I had one brother who, he took all the intelligence and I took all the good looks. <laughs> um, and he, it's, it's, it's interesting with my brother because my mum says that he would come home from school and she would say, how was your day? And he would pull out a pen and paper and draw it and say, I'll show you. And I would come home, I'll tell you. And these days, my brother is an urban designer, a landscape architect, um, who's worked all across the world, including in India. And he currently works for, for Facebook designing parts of their campus. Every single person in the family and the upbringing I had moulded who I am in most significant ways. Firstly, as there is in India, there's a lot of space, but as opposed to India, the vast majority of that space does not have many people. And as a boy growing up, that limitless space allowed me to explore. And I don't think I realised as a child just how valuable that was, but it gave me a connection. 
and it gave me a connection with the world around me. Just feeling dirt under my fingernails and is gum trees. Are you aware of what gum trees are? Eucalypts? Yes. To pull a eucalypt leaf off a tree and crunch it into your hands and one of the greatest smells in the in the world. To feel fresh rain on dirt. Beautiful smell. And this was part of my childhood education, making me aware of my own senses and how my senses could take me somewhere with me just, just standing still. So the country itself, the environment itself was important. And then I had my parents. My father was a creature of his time. He was born back in the 1920s. He was a disciplinarian. He was a hard man. There were days, weeks, months, where he and I didn't get on at all. He was a physically tough man and a very demanding man of both my brother, Lewis, and me. Stand up straight. Stand up straight. Both legs. That was him. I can remember vividly the day a mate of mine, a friend, we would have been about nine years of age, we slept out in our backyard in our farm, in a tent. And the following morning we had to take down the tent and roll it into a bag and pack it away. Dad watched us. He wasn't happy, so we had to pitch the tent and unpack it and put it away again. Pitch the tent, pack it away, do it again. We did it five times. <coughs> I I think I now know more about him that he's passed away than I did when he was alive. Two vivid memories that are very important to me. As a country vet, he treated all sorts of animals, from the smallest of animals to the largest of farm animals. And one day I went out with him and he was treating, just had to give an injection to a horse its name, I'll never forget it, a grey horse named Pinocchio. And Pinocchio just needed an injection and I was to hold the horse with a lead attached to a headstall. Holding the horse, Dad comes over with the needle, all it is is a quick shot, bang, over, away you go. As Dad came over, the, the horse shied, it reared up, the heaviest part of the horse is its head, it reared up beyond the 90 degree, fell over backwards and cracked its head and broke its, broke its neck. Now the owner of this horse was an elderly woman who was a widow whose greatest joy in her life was that horse. And it was my fault. I thought it was my fault. And I was expecting an absolute razzing from my father because he was a tough disciplinarian who'd gone to war, the Second World War, and it was it's your fault. And this poor woman was my Noki, my Noki, my poor Noki. She was in complete distress. And for one of the few times in uh, my father's life, he actually put his arm around me and said, no one would have held the horse. And that was as close as he ever got apart from a couple of other occasions, one of which, when I came home from a football match with my head opened and stitches, he was very proud of me. Um, it was one of the few times he showed outward emotion. And it, it taught me much about him and it made me wonder why he was the way he was. <coughs> and sadly, and this is a lesson, and it's probably one that may be lost a bit in messaging across cultures, because I know Indian cultures treat their elderly with a lot more respect than Western cultures generally do. I wish I'd known a lot more about my father when he was still alive. But he didn't talk about it, and unfortunately, I didn't ask. And after he passed, we found a photo album. 
and in this photo album were what's in a photo album photos. And many of them were photos from the war because my father's role during the war, he served at the tail end in the jungles of Borneo, Malaya. He was in intelligence in a crack commando unit and it was his job, apart from other things, to take photographs. And some of these photographs were in this album. And I came across this one particular page with my mother as we were looking through it. And there were silhouettes, shadows of where the photos used to be. And there were only about three or four photos on the page and they were of my father's brother who served in the same unit, marching Japanese soldiers at bayonet point in the midday sun with carrying big buckets of rocks. And then the next series of photos would have the Japanese soldiers on the ground unconscious and my brother, my, my father's brother, pouring water over them. Uh, this happened after the war when, before my father went home, members of his unit, part of his unit, were responsible for guarding the Japanese war criminals before they decided what they were to do with them. And Mum said that she firmly believed that those pictures were taken and not ripped out of the album because of shame to my father about what they'd done. Those moments in after his passing, I should have known about while he was still alive. And this is the message to, to the younger generations here, although I say it might be a bit of a message lost cross-culturally, that take time to listen, take time to understand, take time to give. Soak it all in, take time to understand what loving can be about and what family and connections can be all about. So to dear old mum, she's 92 years of age, still lives on our farm in the weatherboard house by herself, 50, 60, 70 acres. Still drives a car, bought a new car only two years ago. Um, she's a bit of a character, calls people who are 60 old, but she's not old. In fact, the fact that I just said her age, mum, don't watch this. Because the, only, the closest I've ever really got to saying mum's age is sort of saying, come on, welcome, how are you going? You work? Good to be here. Hello. Hello. Hello, how are you? Sorry, is your name? Is, is that your name? No. Okay. Good to see you. So you haven't missed much, you've just missed Kushra saying how um, I swam from Australia to India to India. <laughs> and that's about the only relevant thing you've missed. So, and uh, where was I? Who can tell me that? Oh, you were going to mention your mom the last Yeah, year. yeah. The, the, I generally just say with a couple more nicks and nudges around the corner, she'll approach Bradman's average. <laughs> <laughs> So she's a remarkable woman and one of the most incredible things about my mum was that she's a woman of words and she's a woman of senses and without directly influencing me, you must do this, you must do that, I soaked in her aura and her manners and her ability to create stories in, in various ways, they're very important to her. Part of that for her and part of Australian heritage going back to some of the early days of pioneer, white pioneer settlement, you had um, two very famous Australian writers called Henry Dawson and Banjo Patterson. And they still are put up on a pedestal in, a, in Australian literature because they came at a time obviously well before television, well before radio, well before all modern communications but they spread the word and they spread the feeling of Australians at the time through their writings. And Banjo Patterson in particular spoke in verse, ballad, and it was very musical ballad that had its, they believe, its origins in the border country between England and, and Scotland. And they rhymed the words, they rhymed the stories because they were then easy to remember. I'm just thinking, 
number one. It was somewhere up the country, in a land of rock and scrub, that they formed an institution called the G-Bung Polo Club. You get that musical lilt. And these were written in a magazine called The Bulletin, and that became known as the Bushman's Bible, because all around Australia, where settlements were popping up, the Bulletin would appear. And stockmen, countrymen, who looked after stock, would carry them in their, what we call, sort of saddlebags on the horses, or they'd put them in their top pockets, and they'd read them. Then, quite appropriately, at night, they'd sit around campfires, and one of their main forms of storytelling was repeating the works of the likes of Banjo Patterson and Henry Lawson. So, those love of words had a very, very, very big impact on me to the extent that they left a lasting impression and that's part of the reason why I'm, I'm certainly here. And it was my mum who introduced me to that. Didn't understand the power of words to any great degree back then. But one other thing she continually told me was to explore the world. And we did it through stories back then because stories, as I said to some of the school children this week, Greg, is that stories will take you much further than any mode of transport will ever take you. Even the rocket that's going to the moon right now. <laughs> okay. Because they travel in your imagination and your imagination has no borders. They go beyond the universe. There's no measurement for where a story can take you. But sometimes a matter of a few words can put you in the right direction where you're going. And due to my mother's influence, when I was, I would have been 1967, I'm just trying to work out how old I am. It would have been 12, it was uh, just 11 rather. It was the start of 1979 and England, the English cricket team was touring Australia. And for those of you who are aware of cricket history, 78, 79 was during one of the biggest splits ever in professional cricket with the Packer era. And many of Australia's players joined up and the Australian team they put on the paddock was not that strong. And England were giving them a walloping. And then it came to the first test, uh, the, the first test of the new year, and it was in Melbourne, and Australia happened to, to win. And in the match after, in the post-conference afterwards, Mike Greeley, the English cricket team, uh, English, English cricket captain, started to boo, uh, was, was booed rather by the, by the fans. And that really upset me sitting at home in my little country town in New South Wales, Australia, watching a little black and white TV set. And Mum said, well, write to him. And letters were the, the mode of overnight expression in the day, write to him. Oh, no, 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 I can't write to the captain of the English cricket team. No, write to him. Write to him. It does remind me, actually, of a, a story about, I know a lot of, uh, Indian children used to write to Don Bradman. And I don't know the exact words, but it goes along the line that Don Bradman told a story once about how he received one letter from an Indian child said, uh, Dear Sir Donald, I am right I know you're old, I am writing to you before it's too late. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I, I did end up plucking the courage to write to him and no more than, um, don't burn this flame. <laughs> no, more, no more than a week later, I received this reply addressed to Mr. James Knight of, of Gunnada. It is very kind of you to take the trouble to write about the interview that I had after the Melbourne Test match. Of course we didn't believe that all Australians share the view of the vocal few. We are enjoying our tour very much indeed. Yours sincerely, Mike Greeley. And I'm six foot four, I would have been about five foot something then and I walked, I walked on clouds for weeks after that. <laughs> the, the sheer <coughs> simple gesture, firstly of my mum to say do it, secondly of a child to undertake it, and thirdly, for a, a man in his position to actually say, okay, I'll write back to this young boy. 
And that gave me even a greater love of cricket. And that helped want me to travel the world together with my mum saying, go and explore beyond the front gate of our farm. There's a big world out there to go and see. And back then, I'm going to play cricket for Australia. That's how I'm going to see the world as it turned out. It didn't work out that way. But as I said to you before, I was lucky. I became a journalist. And my route to becoming a journalist was, Bria, you're listening to this. <laughs> because this is, you're not going to be a cricket journalist, I can tell you. I reckon you're going to be, what do you want to be? A veterinary. A veterinary? Oh, well, there you go. Come and talk to me afterwards. I've got some stories for you. Okay. Rhea is one of the greatest young storytellers in, in Pune, if not beyond. So watch out for her name and listen to her in the, in the future. But I went all the way through school and then I went to college and I studied journalism. Then halfway through journalism, it was back, uh, halfway through college, it was back in the era where journalism was considered more respected if you learned on the job. So I was lucky enough back then to get a job in a country radio station as a cadet journalist, and that's how I began my journalism career. After a while, I decided uh, I wanted a bit of bra a break from journalism and I wanted to pursue cricket again. So I moved to, to Sydney and went back to university and studied a, a recreation leisure type degree. And then I decided, while playing cricket, I wanted to get back into journalism. <laughs> so I went knocking on doors. And I'm only telling this story, Kusra, because you reminded me of it having breakfast this morning. So I know you've heard this. Um, I hope you haven't told everyone yet. <laughs> And I went knocking on doors, and it's the regular thing. It was, thank you very much, send in your resume. Thank you very much, no thank you. Thank you very much, no, we don't need anyone. Eventually, I got a, a phone call saying, can you come in for an interview? This is Anne Edwards of 2SN, come in for an interview. So I went in for an interview, and didn't hold much hope. Thank you very much. Thanks, Anne. And it was either that afternoon or the next day, it was very soon afterwards, phone rings, hello James, it's, it's Anne, I'd like to offer you a job with 2SM, there's a D grade, there was a grading level for journalists, you had cadets, D, C, V, A, senior, and I was only young at the time, I'd like to offer you a D grade position in our newsroom. And that really launched my journalistic career. It wasn't until I left that station about 18 months later that I found out why she actually employed me. And I was expecting her to say, well, you write well, or you have a good voice for radio, a good head for radio too, actually. But she said, you were polite. <laughs> polite. Thank you, please. And that's why I got the job. <laughs> polite. Or polite, uh, sorry if my accent. If there's anything that sounds too foreign for you to translate, Please throw something at me. <laughs> Please, I mean, we're in a very intimate area. Please just say, excuse me, could you say that again? I'm not going to say all 20 minutes again. But <laughs> so that led me on my way, and undoubtedly I wanted to be a cricket journalist. And lo and behold, after radio, I moved into television as a reporter and I got a start in the West Indies, as I said. And then the following year, India came about. 1996 World Cup. Nothing official about it. <laughs> <laughs> if people can remember. Yeah. Yeah. Sponsored by Coca-Cola. Meanwhile, most of the Indian cricket team gets sponsored by Pepsi. And I, rem I remember going into restaurants during that tour, actually. I know a good chuckle from you, so I think, is it your name, sir? Bali. No, it's a good, uh, going into restaurants on that tour, and I'd say, is Larry, is Larry, Aquafina, Cork, nothing official about it. <laughs> I always hold up a Pepsi. That tour was my introduction to India. And from a Western perspective, India can be one hell of a culture shock. And I was not prepared for the first trip, and I was ignorant, and I'm 
embarrassed to say how, how ignorant I was. And I dare say I can't speak for them individually, but I think a number of the journalists on that trip were probably a tad ignorant as well. And we did not embrace the cultures as much as we should have, and we became frustrated by, we've got to get our work done, we've got to get our work done, we've got to get our work done, and our work processes and our work philosophies may not have fitted in with what was happening on the ground in India. And one of the biggest frustrations for us, and it was a technological frustration, which makes me just marvel at how far we've gone. This was back in the days when you had a, a video cassette cartridge with tape. And you'd have to go to a feed-out point. And from that feed-out point, you'd send the vision up to a satellite. And then it would bounce down off a country, probably somewhere in Asia, maybe Singapore. Then it would bounce up again to somewhere, satellite over Western Australia. Then it would bounce down again, then up again and land in a newsroom called Exchange in Sydney. And from there, it would be spread out through the Exchange to various places across Australia. If we weren't in a town that had a feed-out point, because there are only a handful of feed-out points across India, we either had to get on a plane ourselves, so we'd do a story, go to an airport, get to a plane, fly, press a button at a feed-out point, thank you very much, shake the person's hand at the feed-out point, take the film cartridge out, get back on the next plane and come back, film, do our story the next day, oh, cut the story, okay, off we go again on another plane. And it was particularly for our camera, very, very hard. So we actually got to the point where we were standing at airports and our helpers were standing at airports trying to bribe people to take our cassettes on a flight. And we'll say, uh, there'll be a man in a sort of blue hat at the other end. He'll have a sign up, his name will be, and he will take that from you. Um, and imagine the complications that would have caused. And but it worked. Another complication was, these days, literally as a journalist, a mobile phone is all you need. You can get a message anywhere. You can cut a story. You can go from zero to ten every step of the process on that. Back then, between three television crews, Australian television crews, we had about roughly 200 kilograms of equipment. Which meant when you rocked up to an airport, the airport people behind the counter were rubbing their hands in glee for excess luggage. <laughs> so bribery came into, into the equation. And then we tried another journalistic technique that I wouldn't recommend. We, the boss of the World Cup Committee, Jagmohan Dalmaya at the time, we managed to get some letterhead paper from the BCCI, and we wrote letters and forged his name, <laughs> <laughs> saying that uh, these wonderful young men from Australia are carrying the wonderful product of Australia all around the world, aren't they wonderful men? Thank you very much. Please, please waive all excess luggage costs. Don't mind, am I? Pill con. <laughs> so we'd go to the airport and we'd hand that letter over and come this way. <laughs> so, amidst all the frustrations, there were moments that really started leading me down the path of wanting to know more about the people of India. I can remember the very first little sentence, once again, the power of words, that leaves a lasting impression on me when a man in Calcutta just simply, I can't remember the context of it, but he said, Mr. James, we hear a, a poor of pocket, but rich in heart. Right, block that one away. And there are little moments like that throughout. Amidst all the frustrations, we get to the final, Australia makes it all the way to the final. And I can remember, actually I'll, I'll backtrack a bit, this really was a shock to me. Our first game, or one of our first games from memory, was in Ishikapatna, Vizag. 
and we were hurrying to get to training one day and we we're driving, there were about four journalists in the Suzuki, white, thin Suzuki Maruti <coughs> minivan. And the driver, who could not understand us, just assumed we were going to the airport. <laughs> <laughs> and he took us the wrong way. And we said, nay, 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 cricket, cricket, cricket. And, oh, oh. and so he turned around and he immediately panicked and we said, calm, calm, calm. But the more we said, lost in translation, the more we said, calm, 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 the more he put his foot flat to the floor. <laughs> so we ended up going through an intersection and a, a fella on a push bike just happened to be turning right at the time we were going straight through. And he went through our windscreen. <laughs> And he bounced off our windscreens, and a crowd quickly, very quickly, gathered. Uh, I was in the back seat. Uh, one of the journalists, Andrew, was in the front seat, and he was covered in glass. Glass had actually embedded in his legs. So he had a bit of a shock. I went out immediately to see what had happened to the cycle rider, and it pushed him away into the circle until I got a, a big hand on my back saying, "Come." come now. I said, no, no, this, I've got to, no, come, come now. So I came with this man, <coughs> who was a big, strong man with a very strong presence, and he uh, put me into his white uh, Mercedes-Benz along with the other journalists, and he dropped us to the cricket ground. And I said, what, what about the cyclists? What about him? He said, no, if you had stayed there much longer, that crowd would have turned on you is the reason the accident happened. And that really was, was quite a, a wake-up call. That night, which shows one of the contradictions of India, I had to clear my head and I liked to run. So I ran along part of the sea face at Bizac. And I was running along and running along and all of a sudden I heard a, a tuk-tuk putt-putting behind me. And I turned and, and looked at the took the driver and started to, to wave. So I sort of kept on running and didn't think anything more of it. Kept on running and he was still there and then the, the putt, 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 putt got louder. There were two of them. <laughs> and, and before long there were half a dozen or more of them just, just, just following me. And uh, I thought, well, okay, fair enough. And they were saying, Go, 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 and uh, whatever, whatever they were saying. Um, and then I had to turn around to go back to my hotel. And they turned around too. And they just wanted to, to follow me. And then one eventually knew an, an enough English or knew enough uh, appropriate English to yell out, Go, Craig McDermott! The Australian fast bowler at the time. <laughs> they all thought I was, I was Craig McDermott, the Australian fast bowler. Uh, so the contradictions within a matter of hours. <coughs> then we got to the final, and little snippets again. I can remember Australia Sri Lanka final played at Gaddafi Stadium in Lahore, and opposite the ground was the National Hockey Association or National Hockey Stadium. And I have vivid memories, I, I had a, a photo of it to show you, but all these police officers on beds under the stadium, and there were rifles scattered like socks on the beds, and bits and pieces of their, their hardware. And this is where they were sleeping. They'd been brought from all over Pakistan to help as security for the World Cup. And I remember it because we went and I said to my cameraman, this is too good a story not to, to venture into. And the minute we ventured in there with a the camera, okay, this is going to be interesting. There was a bit of, bit of stiffness and they started to, to come forward. There were a few smiles and a few bits of apprehension. There was a bit of everything going on until one obviously senior man stepped forward and he spoke in what I presume was Urdu and I didn't understand him and I looked at him and then he said it again and then he stepped forward and gave me a hug and then he stepped back and I looked at my cameraman Rob and then I stepped forward and gave him a hug Hooray! goes everyone and it, it broke the ice a uh, couple of days later just not so much a hug but just a brush of a shoulder 
as after the final had been decided and the presentation was underway, Benazir Bhutto goes straight past me with her armed guard. And I go, whoa, gee, this is a long way from a country town in New South Wales. <laughs> and those moments stay with me. But there's one moment on that trip, and I know some of you perhaps, who, who read the blog? Has anyone read the blog, the effective pusher to the extent? There's a one arm, okay, not many people, so that, that's good, because I'd like to tell this story, because I told it to the children this week, and sorry Tanya, Tanya has heard this a few times, but to me, and I've told my son this, and when I tell my son a story, it's because it's important. And Nagpur, fairly early on, or Nagpur, fairly early on in the tournament, the day before Australia was to play Zimbabwe in a preliminary game, a colleague and I, Jim, were walking back to our hotel room and on the opposite side of the hotel was a madame. And there were six boys playing cricket. Hey, let's go and have a whack. Let's go and have a game. Yeah, yeah, that'd be a great idea. So we go over and play with them and within a matter of minutes, 10, 20, 30, 40, 200 people have gathered because they all had heard about these tall Australians playing cricket or tall strangers. So we played and then sunset came and we went on our way. Goodbye, 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 goodbye. Next day, the game comes along. Australia wins easily. And prior to that, we told these people we can't play again anymore because we now have work to do. Lo and behold, the next day, Australia wins easily. We finish our work quickly, walking back to our hotel. And those original six boys are there waiting outside the hotel with bat and balls, waiting. Ah, you came. So we go and play again. And again we play until the darkness. And then we shake hands and say goodbye. We have to go. We leave in town tomorrow. I go up to my hotel room on the second floor and I'm drawn to look down. I don't know why I was drawn to the window to begin with. But I look down and when I look down, all of a sudden I see these six boys through the darkness looking up. Hello, sir! Hello! Hello! <laughs> and yeah, that gets you. That, that gets you. So I went down to the kitchen and bought six bottles of water and went out and met the boys again and gave them each a bottle of water. Oh, thank you, sir. Who wants to go for a run? Oh, yes, sir. So we went back to the Madame and we ran through the darkness. And it was a really, you know, it's like the cacophony of noise out there. There's something always happening in the distance, but you're concentrating on, on the moment with these kids. And after a few laps, I can't remember how long ago it was now, but how many laps we'd done, but they started to whisper to each other. I couldn't understand them. And then they took off, leaving me and my footsteps in the dust of a night for That hit me pretty hard because had they got what they wanted? I, I, I don't know. But I'm a runner, so I continued to run. A couple of laps passed, and through the cacophony of noise, you hear this. <laughs> and it's the boys coming back. Stop, son, stop, son, come back, son, stop, son. And what they'd done, they'd gone down to a street vendor and bought a block of chocolate. <laughs> son. Thank you, son. <laughs> Thank you for playing us. I can't accept that. Please, sir. Please, sir. All right. So it's quite appropriate, we're like this now, that we sat down in the darkness cross-legged and shared that block of chocolate. <laughs> and when I tell that story to children, I always have one final line on it. Because this is the power of making stories out of very little. I always open that story by saying, Rita, for example, 
Oh, Dave, Dave, are you still awake? Yeah, yeah, very much. <laughs> Could you ask Dave what Dave is only five? What after you do after you eat a chocolate? What do you do with the wrapper? Put it in the dust bin. Yay! Good answer. <laughs> you put it in the dust bin. That's what you do with it. But to this day. I wish I'd kept that wrapper. Just because, well, stories are onions, they're laid. What you may take out of a story, you or you or you may take something entirely different out of a story, and the dog most certainly has taken something very different. <laughs> so, to me, that really was the hook that told me I'd come back to India and I'd come back to India time and time and time again. In essence, it's just the story. Add it to a pile of stories that you could stretch beyond the universe and back again. But when you break down what a story is, it can make you laugh, it can make you cry, it can bring us together as it does tonight. It can pull us apart as it can do in politics or family relationships or even in a classroom, wherever. It can, one of my favourite powers of story is empathy. Actions speak louder than words and that's been psych psychologically tested but the more studies they do into neuroscience about the powers of stories, they know how powerful stories are in encouraging people to have that, that empathy for others and, and, and feeling for others. Stories do nothing less than help us make sense of our lives and the world around us. That's how we communicate. That's how we've always understood the world. Right back from cave paintings, all the way through to hieroglyphics, all the way through to now, stories help define us and they help connect us. And to me that's incredibly important and that's why I've come here tonight. Because if I wanted to tell stories, yes, we could write a blog, we could share text messages or Facebook or WhatsApp, but it's, it's been here. And the experience tonight is very different, and I must admit, um, I've never gone to a seance, so this is the first time I've actually spoken to people, uh, a, a group like this, in the dark. But it's when you're face to face, and you can feel, you touch, you smell, you hear, you see, all your senses come together into this mixing bowl that gives you a more complete picture. And when you're face to face, you're also enlivened and enriched by being able to dig a bit cult deeper into, into cultures. So stories, in many ways, are very important to me. And along the way, of my professional journey have learned one thing more than anything else about stories. It seems obvious. They're told by people. The not so obvious thing, but I've been lucky because I've met so many people across the world, is that there's not a single person anywhere I can't learn from. If I Give them the time. Time is the most important resource we have because it's the seed from which absolutely everything grows. So, if you give someone the time and you learn to understand them, even if they're very, very different to you, at least you have that understanding to base stronger judgments and stories, connection face to face is a beautiful way to do it. Through my career, I've been extraordinarily privileged because I actually consider myself a doorman. <coughs> because now I write books. And when I write books, non-fiction books, I, someone opens a door and lets me into their life. And we sit down <coughs> and talk. I 
could have picked a phone on a bench or a table or whatever, and we talk. And they expose themselves to me. And then after that process, we shake hands and we hug and do whatever, we keep in touch because the writing process is still to begin. But then that door sort of shuts and go through all the writing process and go along the way and then I open a door here, I open a door here, I open a door over there. I'm opening doors to all the readers to suddenly come into what we've created as a product. And during that process, some of the experiences have been overwhelming, they've been extraordinarily educated, they've been life-changing, and all the way along they've given me a greater understanding about what I can learn from people. For example, I did one book on ambulance officers and firefighters and police officers, and I remember liaising with a, an ambulance officer. He lived in a country town a long way away from where I was living at the time in Sydney. And he agreed to be part of the book. He had a good story to tell. And I met, eventually travelled down to meet him and we had a chicken sandwich at the cafe as our introduction. Then he said, come back to my home. And in the comforts of his own home to a complete stranger, he opened up and imagined the unimaginable with ambulance officers. And here was a grown man telling me a story that had him in tears and here I am holding him over the kitchen table about an incident that had happened many years before that he'd never opened, any, opened up to anyone about. <coughs> or a woman, now this was a very famous story in Australia, a woman by the name of Sally Faulkner who was in a, and in this country you would realise some of the difficulties that can be faced when you have a cross-cultural marriage. She married a, a Lebanese man. They had two children. And at one point, she was very happy for the children to go to, to Lebanon to embrace their culture. Several years after he went, those children are still there. He never brought them back. And in desperation of trying to get those children back, she hired a, a recovery person to go over there. And once that was broken, a television crew travelled with them to actually film what was going to happen. Lo and behold, it all went wrong and they were arrested and they were put in prison with the risk of facing so many years in jail. It actually became an international story. They didn't end up in jail for too long, but long enough for them to for a lot of deals to have to be done to get them home. And not long after she arrived home, I sat on a couch with her in a hotel room with paparazzi, trying to work out where she was, listening to her story, a complete stranger, hugging her, holding her. As a writer, the door opens. So, I'm just a doorman. My latest book, how are we going? Another five minutes? Another five minutes. My latest book is a, about a fellow called Bernie. And in a way it's relative, and, I'm, and Kushru made it relative the other day because he's doing extraordinary work as one of a big team with Lighthouse Foundation, is or Lighthouse Group, what it's called. Youth Empowerment. Youth Empowerment. And there's an equivalent in Australia where a, a fellow in a country town is helping disengaged youths who might have been kicked out of town or might have been kicked out of home or whatever, kicked out of school, and he's using non-school methods to bring them back into society. At the core of his program are farm dogs, and the kids have to look after these farm dogs. And he also teaches them manual skills such as welding and farming and fencing, and it works, and the journey with him was, was extraordinary. And I feel very, very privileged to have sat and opened the door with him. Many other things I'll say, they'll probably come up in, in Q&A, so I'll, I'll shorten it, other than to finish with a final story about India. And it, 
it, I don't know, but once again, it's a layer, so I'll leave it to you to work out how you want to sum it up. In 2008, yeah, 2008, my wife and I visited India because I wanted to bring her here. No, 2005, sorry, 2005 it was. Uh, she was my fiance, and we wrote our wedding vows at the gardens of the Taj Mahal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we, we really backpacked it. We were living in very cheap accommodation rooms and throwing buckets of water over our head. And, but for one night, I said, let's live it up. And we went to a place I'd stayed with the Australian cricket team in 96 called the Grumbuck Palace in, in Jaipur. And as we walked out from the palace to go for a walk, the, the Grumbuck is a couple of kilometres outside, the, for those of you who've been to Jaipur, outside the Pink City walls. And we walked outside the hotel and all of a sudden a tuk-tuk driver came up behind us. Ah! Big smile. Ah! Nah! He just kept walking and... Ta! And he just kept what we would call a curb crawl, just I think stop starting, stop starting, stop starting, following us. And eventually I thought, oh, all right, in we get. And I said, just two kilometres. City wall, yes sir. Those two kilometres lasted eight hours. <laughs> <laughs> because what happened along the way was he suddenly pulled up at an intersection and his eyes started spinning. And he said, your brother has been to India. And I said, yes, he has. But he hasn't been to Jai. Have you been to other places? Nay, your brother here. Right. No, no. Can't be possible. Drive a bit further. And then he stops smack bang in the middle of the road and he says, it was you. <laughs> um, Okay, whatever, you've probably seen a lot of tall, ugly visitors, so I've got a twin somewhere in the world, fair enough. And then he went, holy, 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 the holy festival. And he went, hat, hat. And I'm quite well known for a raggedy old hat I wear. And then I was going, is this possible? And then he went, Man, big camera, big camera, big camera. And 2005, rewind the clock to 1996 when I was here as a journalist at the World Cup. I vividly remember going out onto the street to cover the Holy Festival and hailing down a tuk-tuk driver. And it was this man. <laughs> And in a city of three million, four million, whatever Jaipur is, it was quite extraordinary. So all of a sudden, we were hugging and high fiving, and it went in. He took us all around Jaipur, and then we said goodbye, and there were more hugs. And I'd, if we had the power, I'd show you a, a photo of us together. But that's not the end of the story, because. Three years later, I had a good friend who I just got an email from her out of the blue. I'm in Jaipur, what should I do? Go to the Rumbuck Palace Tuk Tuk Exchange and ask for Rashid. Tell him Mr. James from Australia sent you. <laughs> <laughs> so, she goes to this Tuk Tuk Exchange and not there, but she leaves a message. That night she gets a knock on her hotel door and a hotel person is saying, someone downstairs, downstairs. And there was Rashid with a little photo album with my photo. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Ted, Mr. Ted. <laughs> and the, at the same, same year, uh, I brought a very good friend of mine, the closest friend I've ever had. We've known each other since kindergarten, and my wife and another friend, and we came back to follow a bit of a cricket tour, and we went to to Jaipur as well. So we went to the Rumbuck Palace Tuk Tuk Exchange, <laughs> and I actually had a photo of me and Rashid together because I didn't know what to expect. 
And I walked across the road and a tuk-tuk driver looked at me and he said, I know who you are and I will take you to him. <laughs> and it was his nephew. And Rashid no longer drove a tuk-tuk, he um, grows or breeds or manages water buffalo. So through the murk and the, of an evening similar to the evening here tonight, he drove us into a quarter of Jodhpur and there was Rashid in the street and there were four men sitting around having a cup of tea on a, on a barrel or there were a few chairs and his nephew runs up to him and I get out of the tuk-tuk and run up to him and he looks at me and he just goes, hello Mr. James. <laughs> and so it was expected. <laughs> and it's the last time I've gone back there, but I remember our party, and I remember it because my, my very good mate Richard Tomsey, he was very touched by the fact that this man hugged and when he turned away he had tears in his eyes and so did I. And you look at that and you think, wow, that's, that's coincidence, that's remarkable, that's impossible, that couldn't happen. That's life. And life can be lived in many ways through stories. And that's why they're so, excuse this Rhea, you're old enough, Dave, if you're still awake, your parents will forgive me. There's an Australian word called bloody. The stories are so bloody important. Thank you for listening to, a, thankfully, a bloke you can't see in the dark. And thank you for coming for however far you've come from. It's been an absolute delight to come all this way, which isn't very far at all. So, thank you.